Good evening, everyone, and welcome to our shear on this week's uh, Parsha. Parsha Vayeshev. And also, I think it would be appropriate and expected that we also utilize the opportunity uh, to discuss Hanukkah. Uh, historically, we've been do this, doing this for many, many centuries, that when you have a, a significant event taking place during the week, you try to find a link to the Parsha. And uh, throughout the ages, many great scholars have linked Parshat Vayeshev, Miketz, even Vayishlach to the events of the Hanukkah story. So we hope to do that, uh, but I would like to start off by thanking our sponsor. So I'd like to thank uh, Abe Kaplan and family who are sponsoring to commemorate the yard site of uh, his late wife, Eva Kaplan. Zechrona should have an aliyah from uh, the words of Torah that we study here tonight. And uh, we are always grateful as a shul for the sponsorship. So Hanukkah is coming. Sunday night, and we are getting a head start, especially for those who uh, look at Hanukkah as the holiday that is taking place at about the same time that our neighbors have their holidays. And in some ways, let's be honest, Hanukkah became Lahavdil, a little bit of that holiday. Right, they have gifts. Uh, we have gifts. Uh, they decorate something. We need to decorate something, right? My daughter has to uh, buy uh, all these kind of decorations in a dollar store uh, to put on the wall and on the window. And I have this feeling that it is linked to what our neighbors are doing. Right, nishkefer not the worst thing, uh, but we get ourselves a little bit of a head start for our Hanukkah. It's an early Hanukkah where south of the border, they are giving their drushes this year, not about Hanukkah vis-a-vis -vis Xmas, but rather Hanukkah vis-a-vis -vis Thanksgiving, okay? So they have to bring together turkey and latkes, right? Sufganiyot and stuffing, okay? Cranberry and cheese. So that's what they have to do south of the border because it's so early. Uh, so for us, obviously, we know that Hanukkah is something much, much deeper. And uh, the educated Jew wants to know more about what is this holiday really telling me about myself, about my nation, about my destiny, about my mission, right? That's what we want to know about Hanukkah. So we're going to get some assistance from the weekly portion. And unfortunately, it's not one of... Uh, the stories that make us very proud. When we read sections like Avraham Avinu turning to the Almighty in prayer and, and begging him that he should spare us Zdom, we're very, very proud of Avraham Avinu. You know, that's, that's incredible. These Stomites were very agitating to Avraham Avinu. They were fighting his teachings day in, day out as Avraham Avinu is trying to achieve his mission to teach ethics, values, morality, to make humanity recognize that we are here for a reason and we have a responsibility. Every single day, the stone philosophy was preaching the complete opposite. And God Almighty informs him, you know what? I'm getting rid of that stone. And the expected reaction of an average human being would be, thank God, right? It's about time. But Avraham Avinu prays for them. And, and we, when we think about it, we think, you know, this, this is really an incredible person. And when you think about the fact that Yitzchak Avinu in our tradition is a, man, is a person that is focusing on self-development, we're proud of him. And you open Parashat Vayeshev and you read a story about Yosef tattling to his parents, to his father about the brothers. And this is significant. This is not a six-year-old that's crying to mommy that the uh, older brother just slapped me. But this is rather Yosef telling the father, you should know that if you have teachings 
that you want to transmit to the next generation. And if the pattern of the family continues that there is one chosen son and others that are rejected, I'm the chosen one, dad. I'm, I'm the one, me, Yosef, I'm the chosen one. Because the brothers, they're, they're flawed. They're significantly flawed individuals. There is no way that the legacy of Avraham and Yitzchak could live on with a Ruvain and a Shimon and a Levi Yehuda. Yisachar's will forget about them, right? And the others, right, they're secondary after all. Their children are made servants. I'm the one. So this is like real negative stuff that he's sharing about his brothers. And the reaction obviously doesn't make us quite proud. They didn't kill him. They only sold him to, e to Egypt to put their brother on the marketplace. How, how, how does that make us feel? And it's text that the creator and the author of this text wants us to read every single year and wants us to feel uncomfortable and wants us to recognize that, yeah, we as humans have a flaw. It's jealousy. It's hatred. Address those flaws. And guess what? You Jews, you know, you're special. You declare in the morning, Asher Bachar Banu, that's great. But these flaws exist within yourselves that some of you Jews, says Hashem, think that you are better than other Jews. Some of you Jews think that you are the chosen ones and you are the ones that really represent Judaism. And anyone that's a little bit uh, different than you or perhaps less observant than you should be completely reject rejected. And then there are those that when they hear such messages, they want to sell you. They want to kill you. What chutzpah do you have to believe that you are better than me? So God Almighty is telling us, read this portion, read it, and get agitated by the behavior of your ancestors. And the reason I want you to recognize their flaws is not to put them down because they are actually great people. And I can prove it to you, says God, because eventually there's going to be a high priest and I want him to perform spiritual service with their names on stones, on his breastplate. So don't look down at them, but recognize, recognize that, yeah, there's a flaw there and you still carry that flaw. And if you don't address it, you'll bring about destruction just as they did. That's why it's here. Now, specifically, it appears, commentators note, that when we read this portion, and we feel uncomfortable. We are supposed to link it to a specific period of history. In other words, we are taught, it's an old rule that Nachmanides introduces, and we've been working with it for many, many years, ma'aseh avot siman lebanim. Those actions performed by our forefathers, it's a sign that in future generations, we're going to follow those actions. It is establishing a pattern. And if it's establishing a pattern, you analyze that blueprint because it will guide you how to maneuver through the challenges of the future. So come the commentators, Ramban, Rabbi Ovadia from Sforno. And they say, when you open Parashat Vayeshev, you have to recognize the fact that this is a story that is taking place after Yaakov returns from an exile, but it is also a story taking place before Yaakov and his family goes again into an exile. In what period of Jewish history were our ancestors in the land of Israel, following an exile and before an exile, that was during the period of Bait Shani, the second temple period. So therefore, says Rabovadia of Sforno, when you read this portion and you realize that this is a portion about a family before and after an exile, and they are having major issues internally, internal fighting, which 
by the way, led to the events that brought forth the exile in Egypt, brought forth a future exile. You are reading here a portion that's telling you, do you want to know what will be going wrong during the second temple period? What issue should be addressed? Sinat chinam. Selling a brother to outsiders. And Sfarno adds, study the history of what's happening with the descendants of Yohanan Kohen Gadol, Yehuda Maccabi. Follow the history of what happened to that family, the Hashmonaim. And do you know that eventually there was internal fighting and they basically sold out their brethren to an outsider, to the Romans. Who brought the Romans into the land of Israel? Well, yes, it was an alliance that started with Yehuda, but eventually they sold other Jews to them. They shared negative information about others. It was all about internal issues that existed between Jews and they were selling out other Jews. Rabbi Vadya Svarna is telling us, you want to know the issues and the problems of the second temple period? The root is right here. We're not treating our fellow Jews the way we should. And that leads to exile. And that is exactly what HaKadosh Baruch Hu wants us to do when we read this tragic event. Be mindful of it. It's sometimes hard. We've heard it already last year. We know what's going to happen. But if you think about it, it should be painful. It should be overwhelming. And we should say to ourselves, you know what? What am I doing? In what way can I make the Jewish world better that such an attitude should not exist? This is what Rabavadya Sforno tells us. Now, so what we're going to do is we're going to look at the story and look at the Second Temple period. But what we have to realize is the following. You know, what, when you study history, you realize that uh, communities, people, cultures, they evolve, they change. And especially if you study the modern era, it, it's very different to take, a very difficult to take a 400 year, 500 year period and put it in one sentence. In other words, if I ask you, take uh, humanity from the last, from the year 1520 to today, and give me one word that describes humanity. So probably you would say technology, right? Or uh, uh, enlightenment, you would find some term, but in general, it, it's quite hard to take 500 years, 500 years and put it in one sentence because things change. So as I'm, I'm processing the fact that we're going to talk today about the Bayit Shani, we're talking about a period of 420 years, according to our tradition. And we're going to find one message, one flaw, and we're going to put it all together. It, it's very, very hard to do so. It's very, very hard to do so. But I, I had a little bit of comfort when I was reading in this week's Parsha, this is on the side, that towards the end of the Parsha, there's a description of the baker and the dream that he had. And it mentions there that he had some kind of baskets that carried the loaves, baskets, Saleh Chori. So it's a wicker basket. And Rashi tells us that you should know that when to understand this verse, let me tell you that the baskets that we use here in France to transport our bread, maybe baguette in France come in baskets, I don't know. He says that is the type of basket that is described in the portion. Now, for me, it was nice to hear that Rashi could tell us, and this is not the only time, that he sees something that is taking place in the 10th century, and he's using it to understand something that's described in the Torah that was written uh, 2,500 years earlier. So it's interesting. It indicates that some things did not change. Okay, so that's on the side. My point is more what we have to do, and this is because the rabbis tell us to do this. The second temple period was an incredible time. We're grateful to the Almighty that we regained control during the Hanukkah story. So there was a lot of good. 
but there was a problem there. There was a problem. This was a problem that needs to be addressed by us Jews if we focus on self-improvement. But there is actually a solution. There is actually a solution. What is the problem? What is the problem of that period of time? Problem number one, sinat chinam, baseless hatred. Problem number two, and what I'm going to try to do is to prove that these two problems are one. So problem number one is the hatred, the disdain we have towards our fellow Jew because he's a little bit different, because he thinks he's better than me, or I think I'm better than him. It's a problem. It's a problem. When we cannot tolerate someone that's a little bit different than us, you have a major problem. You have to address it. There's something flawed in your Yiddishkeit. Problem number two, which again, I'll prove is really the same problem, is that sometimes we don't recognize what we are achieving. And by not recognizing what we are achieving, we don't feel comfortable. And what we do, what we find as a solution, which it's not, is we put on a garment of someone else. What do I mean? That's what we're going to have to explain. Now, we're going to talk about problems, but we're going to talk about solutions. And again, I'm looking at the Second Temple period as one era. And if there is one event that we celebrate that symbolizes that period and the solution of the problem of that period, it's Hanukkah, the lights of Hanukkah. And what I'm going to argue is that if there are problems, they are there. But if we study Hanukkah, welcome to the solution. Hanukkah will solve all your, all your problems. And I don't mean by eating one donut the first night and two donuts the second night. That's not what I mean. It's by thinking of what this sim holiday represents. You have a solution to the, to the problems. Okay, now. Let's start analyzing the problems of the Second Temple period. So number one, during the Second Temple period, as mentioned, people did not treat one another with respect. You know, one of the great rabbinic figures of the past two centuries was, was Rabbi Naftali Tzvi Yehuda Berlin, known as the Netziv. And he led the Valozhin Yeshiva in the second half of the 19th century. He was a, a Jewish leader, a Jewish scholar, and a Jewish thinker. And he asks a question. And his question is, why is it that in Midrashim, and even in text itself, the book of Bereshit is identified as Sefer HaYashar, Sefer HaYashar. The book that's straight. So he tells us that you should know you can have a Jew that is righteous. He toils in Torah. He studies Torah, which is the greatest thing uh, we humans can do to study the text of God. But they are flawed if they are not Yesharim, if they're not Yashar, if they're not straight. And what does that mean? He says the following, if they cannot interact with others with respect, and if they see someone that does something that they don't, as it relates to the fear of God, they label them a tzduki and apikores. In other words, if you are a person that's committed to righteousness and to Torah, but when you see someone that deviates from your approach, you label them. Uh, apikores, this is what he says, you are lacking in your yashrut. You're not a straight person. There's something crooked within you. And then he says the following. A Avraham Avinu, Avraham Avinu was a man of faith, was a man that recognizes what God Almighty wants. But guess what? He was able to interact with others who didn't have the same ideology who did not worship the same God he did. He interacted with them with decency. 
he was a Yashar. And therefore, the book of Bereshit talks about great people, Avraham, Yitzchak, and Yaakov, who were Yesharim. Now, when Rabbi Naftali Tzvi Yehuda Berlin is writing this, let's say around 1870, he is not just talking about a problem that existed during the Second Temple period, which he does write that this was the flaw of the Second Temple period, that they were committed to Torah during that period of time. They studied, but they couldn't interact with anyone that thinks differently. But he was not just talking about the Second Temple period. He was talking about the 1870s because the Jewish world, unfortunately, was expanding. And you had those who were extremely traditional and, for example, would reject anyone who is studying philosophy or medicine or ethics or mathematics. And then there were others who were able to see that, you know what, you could find wisdom of Hashem in everything. And the problem he recognized was that those who were narrow, who believed that only Torah is expected, had an extremely negative attitude towards those who were interested in things that are beyond Torah. And it bothered him. He was an intellectual. He was familiar with different ways of thinking. And therefore he writes and he wants the reader to know, be committed to Torah, that's wonderful. Be a righteous person, that's wonderful but be tolerant of people that are perhaps a little bit different. He writes it in 1870 because it's a problem that we have in the Jewish world. It brought about our destruction and it's preventing us from ending this Hurban, ending this Galut, ending this exile. So that's the problem. Now, I mentioned that there are two problems of that period of time. But let's go through, let's talk about the second, the second problem, the second problem. Shabbat Hanukkah, not this coming Shabbat, which is the day, uh, it's, it's, it's the day before, two days before. But Shabbos Hanukkah, Varshas Miketz, we're going to read an Haftorah. We've in the past studied this Haftorah, and it's a vision of the prophet Zechariah. And in his vision, there is a person that was well known during that period of time, the leader of the Kohanim, Yehoshua HaKohen HaGadol. He's a great person, no question about it. But it seems to me that there was some kind of flaw, there was a problem. And Satan, meaning this force that focuses on the negative and identifies the negative, which of course we humans have to fix, but Satan is not one, not, it's not a real entity, but it's more symbolically someone pointing out a flaw. So Yehoshua HaKohen HaGadol, the great man, has a problem because he was Lavush, so keep your eyes out next Shabbos when you read this, Lavush Begadim Tsoim, he was wearing the high priest, you know the image of a high priest, right? These garments, these the breastplate. He, he, you look, you're looking at royalty. You're looking at royalty. These garments, the effort that goes into it, the impression. It's supposed to make an impression by looking at him. But he is described here by the prophet Zechariah as one who is wearing begadim soim, soiled garments. Soiled garments. There's a problem. There's a flaw there. Zechari, unfortunately, does not explain to us what that symbolizes. Now, God defines him. God, God, God defends him, I mean. God defends this high, this high priest. But there seems to be some kind of flaw, not one that we reject him completely as a result, but the Gadim Mitzoyim is a problem. So all commentators have different insights, many, many different insights. I'm going to share with you now what Rabbi Don Itzchak Abarbanel tells us. And he says, you should know, when we look at the Second Temple period, and this prophet Yoshua is in the beginning of that era, we have to look at it and realize that there was one event that really captures the whole period. 
That's the Hanukkah story. When you celebrate Hanukkah, you are supposed to be mindful of 420 years, the second temple period. It's the big event, and it's the only holiday that we have that we celebrate something that occurred at that time. So it's a very, it's a loaded holiday. The heroes of the holiday are the descendants of Yehoshua HaKohen HaGadol. Yohanan Kohen Gadol, Matityao, Matityao ben Yohanan Ubanav, they're descendants. We celebrate them. We celebrate them. Okay. I, Matityao is, a, is, is, a, is becoming more and more of a popular Jewish name. I actually had a great, great grandfather by the name of Rev Matityao Malevsky. So it's a name that obviously indicates that he is of great significance. We celebrate this holiday. We read the stories, the courage, the courage to fight the Syrian Greeks despite the odds. They're incredible people. Yoshua is great. But there's a little bit of a problem, points out that Barbanel. They did something wrong. What did they do wrong that symbolically means they were wearing soiled garments? Says the Barbanel, Shena'asu. Melachim Velo Hayu Mezera David. After the rebellion, there's a, a void in leadership. And I don't blame the Hashmonaim. I don't blame Yehuda for taking it upon himself to be the leader because there's a void. You get rid of the Syrian Greeks, someone has to make decisions, someone has to take control. So the Kohanim had probably every right to do so. But as soon as they gained control, the first thing on their to-do list should have been, okay, now that we Jews are in control of our destiny, the right thing to do is to find a proper ruler. And in our tradition, we are told that the ones to guide and lead and rule over the people of Israel in the land of Israel especially, are the ones who are descendants from the house of Yehuda, descendants of David HaMelech. And unfortunately, the Hashmonaim did not do it. They held on to power a little bit too long. Study politics, study world history. It's a common story that you could have someone that's extremely capable but when the right time comes to hand it over, they simply can't. They simply can't. And they lose big time as a result. So it seems to be that this flaw of the Hashmonaim is a significant one. It's a significant one. And by the way, as a result, Nachmanani tells us the whole family had a major downfall. And they, in essence, vanished. And a century after the Hanukkah story, the behavior of the descendants of this family is very far from the values of the ones who established their dynasty. And eventually they even vanished. There were not, no, one, not, no, one, no one was left because they violated this teaching, this precept that, you know what? Leadership needs to be from Misera David. Major problem. And for the Barbanel, this is not just a random problem that we're trying to point out, but this relates to the core issue, the core problem, the core flaw of the Second Temple period. So in what way, and now we're going to have to figure out, in what way is Sinat Chinam comparable or perhaps linked to someone wearing a garment, a garment that's not theirs, right? Taking on the garb of royalty when you are supposed to be a Kohen. Kohanim, with all due respect, you're great people, but focus on service in the temple. You know, give words of encouragement. You are guide me, teach me, inspire me, but please don't take charge of politics, right? That, that was given to someone else. Don't take a garment that's not yours. 
And my question is, in what way is that similar to Sinat Chinam? Because if we are saying that these are the flaws, this is a flaw that defines the period, it must be that it is comparable. And I think the answer is based on a Midrash. Based on a Midrash. The Midrash tells us that Hanukkah being celebrated on Kislev is not random, not at all, but rather our ancestors in the wilderness, the Midrash tells us, began the process of gathering the goods needed for the construction of the tabernacle, the Mishkan, right by Sukkot. But it seems like they were efficient and within two months and 10 days, they had it all ready. Meaning our ancestors were ready for the construction of the tabernacle in the month of Kislev, right around Hanukkah. But the Midrash tells us that the Almighty communicates with Moshe Rabbeinu and he says to, to him, you know what? Uh, I, I would like to delay it until the month of Nisan. We're not ready yet. We're not ready yet. The nation itself, the Midrash tells us, were upset. And they ask, listen to these four words, according to the Midrash. Perhaps there's something flawed within ourselves. Shema dofi irabo. Maybe we did something wrong. In other words, when they saw the result that it was not built immediately, they immediately started questioning themselves, feeling uncomfortable about themselves, feeling perhaps that it's a flaw of ours that is preventing the construction of this incredible building, this incredible structure that is here to teach us and humanity that there was forgiveness for the sin of the golden calf. And the truth is Moshe tells them, calm down, calm down, Jewish fellows. But rather, I would like to delay it to the month of Nisan, the month Shenolad Bo Yitzchak. Now, HaKadosh Baruch Hu felt that, you know what? Kislev lost out. They had the potential of building a tabernacle and having their dedication, Chanukah. So therefore, Amar HaKadosh Baruch Hu says the Midrash. Alay Lishalem, the Almighty said, I need to pay back this month. How was it paid back? With Hanukkah. Okay, this is this Midrash. So the way I read the Midrash is that we humans have our ups and downs. And if you don't have ups and downs, perhaps you're a robot and not a human, right? Because as humans, we have good days, we have bad days, we have moments that we feel in other words, I see purpose in what I am achieving, the world is what's created for me. And then we have moments that we ask ourselves, why am I in existence? What difference would it make if I vanish? We have our ups and our downs. It's important to remember, my brother, the psychologist says that the Talmud tells us that a person in Kriyat Shema is obligated to mention the day during the night and the night during the day. In other words, in the morning Shema, we say Yotzer or Uvarech Hoshech. We mention darkness in the morning, and at night, we say, we mention the day at night. And my brother explains that we humans always be, need to be mindful of our other state. When you are extremely happy, you have to remind yourselves that, you know what, you will be going through challenge. And perhaps you could take some of that happiness and feed it into that challenging moment. And so too, when you are in moments of darkness at night, Remember there's light and that's how we could function by being mindful of the fact that we have those ups and our downs and it's easier to deal with the challenges of existence. Okay, now, Kislev symbolizes darkness and we're not the only culture, by the way, that have celebrations of light during Kislev because it is rational for the human being to try to create light when the nights in the Northern hemisphere are long. It's long and cold, right? This year it's a little bit, it's a, we're still in a merciful period, but I have a feeling that come December, it's going to be a little bit colder and the nights are a little bit longer. It gets dark already. 
right? You're driving back from work at 5.30. It's dark. Sometimes in December, you're going to be driving to work. It's dark. That's depressing. It's depressing. And this depressing state is one that perhaps could lead us to start asking ourselves, what am I, what's wrong with me? What am I achieving? Shema dofi irabo. In other words, just as our ancestors questioned themselves in Kislev, did God, does God do not, not like my temple? It's something that we can experience. Does God not like my contribution that I'm making? I'm, a, I'm, I'm an honest businessman. I'm an honest doctor. I'm an honest teacher. We start questioning ourselves. We start questioning ourselves. Questioning ourselves, if it's not treated, leads to many ailments. When you're not happy with yourself, when a person does not recognize what they are achieving, there's a whole series of ailments that it brings forth. I believe that sinat chinam, hating my fellow, is really the result of not loving myself in a proper and healthy way. If I recognize I'm achieving things, right? If I recognize that I daven, I study Torah, I'm kind to others, I'm, I'm, I'm mindful of the fact that I represent something. If I really feel it, if I number one, do it, and number two, feel it, I don't have to look down at anyone else. Why do I have to hate someone else if I feel comfortable with myself? And I think we all know that people who are negative towards others and find flaws and only share negative things about others, they're suffering. They're, they need help. And it, perhaps with that help of appreciating what they are achieving, they can interact with others in a much healthier way. That's number one. Number two, a person, a person who is satisfied with what they are doing does not need the garment of someone else. You don't have to dream that you would be, you're going to be a movie star or a, a famous football player or hockey player. If you are happy with what you are achieving, you don't have to wear someone else's garment. People sometimes wear garments of other people. You know, like I, I've noted that you have a store in the mall that's called Forever 21. It's really, it really does exist. Forever 21. And it's made for people who are in their late 40s and early 50s, perhaps. I don't know. I'm just guessing. I've not been in there. I'm not planning to buy anything there. And are having difficulty with their essence and with their existential uh, existence, the challenge that life is moving on. And they wish they would be Forever 21. So you go to Forever 21 and perhaps wear that garment that a teenage, even a teenager shouldn't, but at least a teenager thinks they should and you put it on, you feel that you are younger. You're not happy with who you are. Perhaps if that person would realize that, you know what? You've been around for many decades. You, you could really inspire others because you went through challenge, you dealt with it with a smile and you bring happiness to others. You know, your years of experience, your decades of experience that the 21 year old doesn't have can make a tremendous difference to the world. And if you do it and you're aware of it, you don't have to wear, wear clothes from Forever 21, right? You could go to, to other uh, uh, department stores and find things that are more appropriate. People who are not happy with who they are need the external garment. And it appears that with all due respect to the Hashmonaim, if they would have realized the value of being a Kohen and inspiring, they would have had no problem handing over Malchut to descendants of the house of David. And there's no doubt there were qualified individuals they could have done it to. But they weren't seeing value in self. Second temple period. You want to know the flaw? The flaw is not seeing value in yourself. That's the ailment. That's the problem. What's the solution? What's the solution to bgadim so'im, right? Wearing someone else's garments. By the way, the second temple period also led to destructive zealots. Destructive zealots. Read up about the last years of the second temple. Kanaim, zealots. And I've unfortunately over the years have interacted with zealots. And zealots 
are people that 1% of them, in my, in my assessment, 1% of zealots are incredible people. Our tzaddikim are on a very, very high level because they have a passion and they're honest to it. And there are people that inspire me, but it's only 1%, unfortunately. I had a teacher, his name was Rabbi Shem Shem Pincus. He was a zealot, but every bone of him was honesty. There was nothing that he did that was not his true level. So when he would cry out about an issue, it was not some external act. He felt it. I knew him well. I knew that it was true. He was one of the 1% individuals. But 99% of the zealots are people that are struggling with themselves. They're not so satisfied with who they are. So what do they do? They take on an issue to be a warrior for faith. They wear some external garment. It's not them. They're wearing gadim tsoim. I was sitting at a wedding last week and I was sitting next to Rabbi Rothman from Thornhill. And he told me a story about, a, about uh, 10, 15 years ago. There was one of these tragic stories of a person who appeared to be very, very from and very orthodox and very committed, uh, who his behavior in his personal life came out at some point and we figured out he's a phony. We have such stories, unfortunately, in our from world. So he told me that this fellow, this label, won't give a last name, a few months before the news came out about what he's doing in his private life, he came to Toronto because he heard that there was someone teaching here in town that according to this individual, the zealot, what he is teaching is against our hashkafa, our outlook, our philosophical outlook at Torah. And he decided that it's his job to uproot this fellow, that everyone should know that he is a heretic. And he came to Toronto to convince senior rabbis to go ahead and declare that this fellow and his teachings are unacceptable. A warrior, a warrior for Hashem and his truth. And then five months later, we find out what a corrupt individual is in his personal life. How do we explain this? How, how, how do you explain such behavior? The zealot is unsettled because he knows he shouldn't be doing it, whatever he was doing. He's unsettled. So what do you do when you are unsettled and you don't appreciate, when you don't do good, or if you don't appreciate the good you do, which is also a significant problem, you wear some external garment, gadim tsoim. That's the problem. You want to know the solution? The solution are the Hanukkah candles. When you read about the story, the story of a little bit of oil, and by the way, for many, for many years, our ancestors and the scholars didn't focus on the nes pach Hashem, and on the, on the nes, on the miracle of a little bit of oil lasting not for just one day, but for eight. It wasn't something that they, they focused on uh, so much during the second temple period. During the second temple period, the main celebration was the fact that we have independence. We Jews control the land of Israel. A Torah Jew, by the way, celebrates that. When Jews are in control of the Jewish land, it's something to celebrate. They celebrated for 200 years. The Nespah Hashemen was not focused on. And the reason is because, truth being, a Ness in the Bet HaMikdash was nothing special. And in some ways, they were disappointed because they knew very well that during the first temple period, there were so many, so many more Nisim, right? Uh, I, I compared it last year that imagine during COVID, there was a COVID wedding, and you come to the Shmorg and you see two trays of sushi. But you remember that two years ago at the same family at their wedding, they went before COVID, they had 18 different types of sushi. So you don't come home saying, oh, gishmak, there were two types of sushi. You don't say that because you remember the 18 from two years ago and you say, oh, Zaharnas had dug We remember the good old, uh, you know, 18 types of sushi that we had once upon a time. So during the second temple period, the focus on a nest was not anything great for them. It was even disappointing. But after the destruction, when the rabbis want us to keep Hanukkah as a valuable holiday, even though we lost our independence, 
the rabbis tell us, you know what the nest of Hanukkah is about? That even though it's dark, and even though it appears you only have a little bit, recognize how much value there is in that little bit. You think you're not achieving anything, right? You think that those acts of kindness or those people that you inspired or the person you smile to, you think you're not achieving anything? Well, guess what? The person you smile to or the person you treated with decency or the person you were honest with when you interacted with them, you gave them a boost. And as a result, they really changed their life or perhaps they changed someone else's life, right? Or perhaps years later, they kept these positive messages and inspired someone else. It could multiply. Look what you are achieving when you do good. The little bit of light lasts much longer than what you think. A little bit of oil could burn for very, very long. Light inspires light. So when we are dark and we feel like our ancestors did in the wilderness, Shema Dofi Irabo, Kislev, that moment we doubt ourselves, needs a Hanukkah. And when you have a healthy Hanukkah, where you feel, you know what, good inspires good. Light brings more light. Happiness brings more happiness. Good deeds. And when I teach Torah and people are inspired and they find meaning in their life and then they in turn teach others Torah. When you have an appreciation for that, it will bring an end to Sinat Chinam because I'm happy with myself. I don't have to put anyone down. No need. I'm comfortable with who I am. And even if they insult me, I'm still comfortable with who I am. I don't have to put them down. And I don't have to wear someone else's garment. Right? I don't have to start wearing a garb of someone uh, that is very respected. I think that if I put on that garb, something external, I'll be a success story. No need. No need at all. Because you value the good you are doing. Do good and value it. Recognize the fact that light could last much, much longer than anything you ever intended. That's the Hanukkah story. And that is the cure to the second temporal ailment. And that is how we could look at Parashat Vayeshev, read the tragedy of these interactions, and then in turn say, you know what? We're going to celebrate Hanukkah, and that's going to bring the Gilulah in Hasidic sources, the Bnei Soschar, Svas Emes, and Hasidic sources. They talk about the fact that Hanukkah is a chinuch, it's a training, it's a training, a chinuch is a training for us to be in the mode of welcoming the Mashiach. In what way is Hanukkah, and this is something that you find often in, in the Hasidic thought, in what way is Hanukkah the holiday that will lead us into the Messianic era? Self-value. Do good and appreciate it. It will change the Jewish world. You'll change your attitude towards others and others towards you. And indeed, it will bring forth what we are waiting for, the true light with the true menorah in the Beis HaMikdash, Bimeheira Biyomeinu. So that's a little bit of a message on the day. Thank you again, Dave Kaplan, Shom and Aliyah. I thank everyone for joining. It should be a very meaningful Hanukkah, a time that we have an appreciation for ourselves. And it's a time that I can express my appreciation that you join me. It's always nice to learn together. And it should be a, a, a good Shabbos and a Freilich and Hanukkah to all. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.